Farmer Tom here. Welcome to the Farmer Tomcast and my ongoing series, Heroes of the Green. Today we've got Jerry Wadden, legendary hemp farmer, grower, breeder, all around just amazing guy. How's it going today, Jerry? I'm doing really well, Tom. I'm flattered to be on the list of people that you think are worthy of noting. Oh, definitely, definitely. So uh, I'm going to give the mic to you, and you can tell the world your story. Everybody wants to hear who Jerry Whiting is. Oh, all right. So uh, so me and Cannabis Sativa L go way back. I'm a couple months away from being 69. Uh, the, the numbers are born in 53, high school class of 72. I grew up outside of Cleveland, and I first encountered our favorite plant when I was 15 years old. and. Um, I've always been a curious kind of character, pretty science driven. Actually, the seminal work was uh, I was staying in D.C. with my grandmother because my grandfather had just died. And it was um, 1967. And Look Magazine, that weekly news magazine, had a story that was supposed to be about um, hippies and Haight-Ashbury and drugs. The lightning war in the Middle East uh, broke and being a weekly magazine, they pushed that to the cover. I was at my grandmother's house, you know, and uh, read this article about hippies and hate Ashbury. And I'll never forget, it was a multi page article. In the lower right corner of one of the pages was a call out box that listed drugs and it had the name, the nicknames, the chemical name, and the effects. I looked at through that is like a shopping list. It talked about um, pot and hash. It talked about acid and mushrooms and peyote. And at this point, this is 1967, these were plants. You know, besides acid, there wasn't a lot of um, designer chemicals. These were plants that you could either find and collect or grow and get changed in your head. Anyway, So the problem, of course, was that I was 14, 15 years old. I was 14 when the article came out. I had no idea where to go shopping. I had no idea where to find this. So, um, but this thing, and I found a copy of that Look magazine as an adult. I've got it somewhere in storage. I laugh looking at it now. I first encountered it, and it's a really funny story. I grew up uh, going to an Episcopal church, uh, uh, you know, And there was a youth event on Thursday nights. And uh, and it was great. You know, not everyone was a member of the church. It was a place to hang out. It was fun. Anyway, uh, I'm being driven home with my good buddy, Scott. And uh, uh, two friends who were a year older than me were driving us home. And he lit a joint, passed it to her. And without uh, saying anything, Passed it to the back. And of course, Scott and I were on the back just freaking out. He didn't get stoned. I did. And that was the case for the first three times. Took three times before Scott sure clicked. Anyway, I fell in love with this sensation. It was great. Um, I tried a bunch of different stuff, but I came back to what I call DOCs, drugs of choice. Cannabis, beer coffee and tea. Those are my three. I have recently added psilocybin, microdosing, um, but all the recreational stuff, it, I don't do it anymore. Um, and I really look at cannabis as medicine. So uh, going into high school, um, so I'm getting out in 72, the war in Vietnam is going on. And so older friends and, and uh, their siblings Some of them had cycled through Vietnam where there was, wow, there was pot and it came back. And we were catapulted away from bricks of Mexican dirt weed wrapped in paper with junk inside to like Thai stick and hashish came through those channels because the the U.S. had a large presence in Europe and those the Seventh Fleet in the Mediterranean and, and all the people in Germany, they got access to hashish coming out of uh, Morocco, Algeria, Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera. 
So through high school, I altered my consciousness on a regular basis because I loved getting stoned. And, um, but I also, being the nerd that I was, wanted to know what was in there and how it worked and what was next. So I'm a voracious reader. I, I was getting, a, by the time I got out of high school, I, was, I had a subscription to the Berkeley Barb. And I read other alternative newspapers, but I grew up in Cleveland. The stake on the lake, dreary on the Erie. There wasn't a lot of bohemian hippie influence, <clears throat> though for those who know Ohio, back in the day, I lived on both Coventry and Hessler. I had a checkered history with school. I, I'm not stupid, but I, would, I was bored by school. But my parents, who were both educated professionals, allowed me and encouraged me with chemistry sets, electronic component things, microscope, telescope, but more importantly, classes at museums and after-school programs. And uh, I ate this shit up. So the time I, I should have been out of high school, I sort of dropped out. I turned 18 my, in December of my senior year of high school. My parents weren't exactly happy with my ethnobotanical explorations. Back then, my father was a lawyer, CPA attorney. Um, uh, uh, marijuana was a narcotic and he'd pull out the law books and go, are you still horsing around with narcotics dead? It's not habit for me. Well then stop. I don't want to. I ended up moving out my uh, senior year of high school. I turned 18 on a Sunday, I think. And I moved out on Thursday. I ended up supporting myself with a friend who was a year older uh, in the import and distribution, uh, things that were coming through Tucson from Mexico uh, and later from Jamaica, made its way to Cleveland, where characters like Mark and I distributed it. By the time I was 19, trivia point, the first Thanksgiving I didn't sit at my family table was in Tucson, Arizona, with the people who had been shipping kilos of marijuana that I was selling in Cleveland. That was an amazing evening. Um, anyway, so I'm pretty immersed in this. And in, in high school, my senior year, as bad a student as I was academically, uh, uh, there was a poster outside of my guidance counselor's office about summer programs offered by the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And there was one in creative writing and I was writing poetry and stuff. And so I went to Ann Arbor the summer of 71 between my junior and senior years of high school. A grad student was teaching this two-week creative writing thing. The reason I mention it was, or is, um, I had been reading uh, newspapers from Detroit and Ann Arbor, The Sun, and uh, John Sinclair of the White Panther Party was out of Ann Arbor. And the two weeks I was there was the Ann Arbor Art Fair where the city is taken over by artists, I mean, from around the country, around the world. That was a mind blower. But there were also free concerts organized by, it was the White Panther cultural arm. Anyway, I went to these. And the best part was marijuana was a $5 fine. It was a parking ticket. The two years after high school, I lived in Cleveland, I mentioned these two neighborhoods, Holy Hippies, Cleveland uh, had a, a Kessler Street and uh, Coventry. Um, I was going back and forth um, and eventually moved to Ann Arbor in 1974. Before I left, I mentioned that my parents, uh, you know, encouraged me to learn and had, have chemistry sets. Well, by the time I left Cleveland, I was using what we're now, you know, it'd be called RSO, uh, made with hydrocarbons, not knowing how stupid that was, hash oil. You know, um, and we were moving uh, 10 pounds a week, my buddy and I, each and every week. To this day, I try and smoke my misspent youth. I don't want modern cultivars. You show me Maui Waui, Thai stick, Jamaican, uh, Oaxacan, um, uh, all manner of hashish, whether charis, you know, finger hash or dry sift, you know, the yellow or red. I'm down with that. That's what I want. I always want. 
So in Ann Arbor, my life took a turn in that I was turned on to acupuncture and Chinese medicine, ended up going to Boston to attend acupuncture school and practiced um, massage acupuncture, uh, simple herbology for, I guess, seven years. And in 86, uh, attempted to relocate my practice to Seattle because there were two acupuncture schools in Boston and there were too many acupuncturists. When I got here, uh, I oh, I had worked for a startup in Boston before I left. And when I got to Seattle, it was just in time uh, to work for a startup. And at that point, it was growing quickly. Aldous, page maker, desktop publishing. I never did go back to acupuncture, but spent the next 30 years in Seattle working both at Aldous and then my own company, Azalea Software. So how does this relate to cannabis? Well, I, it, I, it explains my deep history with it as a kid. Oh, and one of my childhood friends, Tom Werchapter, had an older brother named Don Werchapter of the Cannabis Museum thing. Um, and uh, in Ann Arbor, I met this character doing politics who threw um, the, bicent the Bicentennial Dilemma, Who's in Control? A three-day teach-in that I videotaped, um, organized by Martin A. Lee. Yes, a Project CBD thing. So I guess in this incarnation, I was um, doomed to hang out with people who would be pillars in the cannabis movement from, hell, I met Donnie in first grade. I've been in, in Seattle rather since 1986. And the way that this, mm, I don't want to say leapfrog, but propelled me into the cannabis world in a different way. I had, uh, my wife and I had three sons. The older two developed a seizure disorder with uh, the onset of adolescence. My oldest, Michael, outgrew his. Coleman, on the other hand, while we were somewhat estranged, invited me out to lunch at a local brew pub that the family frequents. And when we sat down and ordered, he threw his green card on the table and said, Dad, I want to transition from pharma to medical marijuana. Oh, I don't know much about that, but Marty Lee is coming to stay with us again in two and a half weeks for Hempfest. Now, Hempfest is this protestable third weekend in August here in Seattle that has many facets, but for many of us, the, the center of Hempfest is the Hemposium, this large tent where people give talks, serve on panels, et cetera, et cetera. And it really is despite all the tie-dye and patchouli, um, a, a gathering place of newbies to elders and a free exchange of information at a pretty high level. You can trust HempFest for what it is. Anyway, Lisa and I used to run what we jokingly called the HempFest Hostel. We had friends who were uh, speakers, exhibitors, et cetera, et cetera, who would stay with us. And we'd already been going because we're potheads. Marty did stay with us for six days. Smoke Signals, Social History of Marijuana in America that he wrote came out because when it was released, he was staying with us one or two years later. And I remember one of the news stations sent a limo to pick him up to do an interview, you know, which is really fun. Coleman approached me about swapping out pharma for cannabis to treat his seizure disorder. Marty stayed with us, not for a couple nights, six days. And he came with mason jars of this stuff that didn't get you stoned, but it got you well. And it was my first introduction to CBD-rich cannabis. At that point, there were lab tests beginning to be done to look for uh, cannabinoid levels. And at that point, 4% or greater was considered CBD rich. That's been bred up to double digit now, but this was a big deal. And the history is when hippies went to, you know, overseas and came home with seeds, they brought those seeds home to grow hot to get stone. If the plant didn't have high THC, but had CBD, which they didn't know, they threw it out. That's not why they grew it. They grew it to get high. Excuse me. Over time, and we're going back 40, 50 years, over time, the domestic gene pool shifted 
from the distribution of type 1, type 2, type 3 plants, they're predominantly type 1, high THC, stoned or reefer to get you high. So when Marty came with these mason jars of cannabis that I felt something, but I wasn't stoned, I was intrigued. The best thing homeboy did was leave one of those mason jars with me. Here was the lesson I'd learned. For years, since I was a kid, puff, puff, stone, puff, 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 more stone, puff, puff, whoa, I'm really buzzed. With the CBD stuff, it was like puff, puff, whoa, puff, puff, I feel really, this is great, puff, 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 I'm relaxed, I'm chill, this is wonderful. But I'm not impaired, I'm not intoxicated. At that point, Coleman and I were on a mission he had a green card. I became his designated, designated provider that I could uh, grow, buy, and possess on his behalf. It was a license to get high legally. Anyway, it really was a bonding influence on my relationship with Coleman John. For the next couple of years, we, we did a lot with CBD. I grew it. I, did, I cut clones. Um, at one point, we drove across the state from Seattle to Spokane every other Wednesday, distributing clones like, you know, Pied Piper, just leaving them all over the place. Um, we also have a, had a tight relationship with Analytical 360, the venerable testing lab here. They would funnel people our way. We had people coming from overseas just to talk about this stuff. Um, in the end... Fred Gardner and Marty, Marty Lee, at the last minute, did not come to Hempfest. They paid for the booth across from the Hemposium. Um, but other things came up. What you ask? It was the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where Sunday was Sanjay Gupta's show about Charlotte Figgy and Charlotte's Web. And he had sort of uh, telegraphed the punch. He had sort of said, I've been wrong all these years. Watch this show Sunday. Well, word got out. The Project CBD booth at Hempfest that year, across from the Hemposium, was <laughs> Fred and Marty said, booth is paid for, you do it. So it was um, myself, Brian, my youngest, Coleman, who I just mentioned, their respective girlfriends, and a pal, Pamela Hale, it was us. And Marty said, this is a big deal. Uh, you can do the short talks on the main stage. I'm gonna pass on the symposium, but um, here's who you should expect. And the totally cool thing was, um, I had already gotten a pack of Charlotte's Web Seeds from a friend in Colorado. I had a list of CBD cultivars and where to buy them and my webpage, which was on the table with the Project CBD literature, which was the coming out of LeBlanc c and &E, my company. And LeBlanc is whiting in French. There's a bunch of French jokes in the company called corporate culture. Anyway, among the people, I mean, the D'Angelo's, yeah, but really the people that I met at that hemp fest that I'm still tight with are DJ Short and Jorge Cervantes. They both spent, DJ spent all three days in the booth and Jorge two of the three days. It turns out all three of us love traditional hashish. And that's what I made. That really, it made us a local lightning rod for people who were looking into medical marijuana, not stoner pot. And it was um, the first year of a long standing relationship with Seattle Hemp Fest where I have been a speaker and on panels and writing checks and whatnot ever since. Um, and it also, when I say coming out, there was this public base that was out there, but also I took it much more seriously because it wasn't just for my son and a handful of friends that I was making tincture and other products. All of a sudden, if you're looking for CBD, there's this guy. And that word of mouth persists to today. And to jump to the end of the story, 
Coleman ended up uh, working not one, but two Eden CO2 extraction machines. He was a real wizard with that. He was doing um, nano emulsions before everyone else. When he realized that uh, he worked at a couple of dispensaries, when he realized that gay people were coming in looking for a lube, he said, I'm sorry, but the standard lubes will eat away at the latex. Let me make one that won't for you. He would come to talks that I would give. I was not allowed to pimp his, his illness. Um, I wasn't supposed to say, well, you know, my son, did not but when people would come up afterwards to ask me questions, he would often take and field those questions himself. Six, six years ago this May, uh, Coleman died of a seizure. Um, SUDEP, sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. We knew a family that had lost a daughter. His seizures were irregular in periodicity, but they got increasingly more severe. And we both, we ended up really close. We spent a lot of time together at this period. We knew that if it was extrapolated out, there was a chance he would die of a seizure. And he did. Worst fucking day of my life. Um, it is what propels me to this day, each and every day, to make medicine, to, uh, to uh, end the suffering of all sentient beings. Um, I do a bunch of, I, at that, until the, the lockdown and people weren't moving around in, in the same social patterns, I got a lot of referrals from other families with children suffering from seizures and autism. And I had good luck with it. The irony being, of course, that my own son died of a seizure despite his and my best efforts. Um, we never told his mother about SUDEP because we knew that she would worry and there was nothing anyone could do. A lot of people, even in the community, in the Canna family, did not know that Coleman had seizure disorder. Um, he didn't want to be, not that he was embarrassed, but he didn't want to be thought of as a sick person. He lived life to the fullest. He was a recording artist. He ran a 16-track board. He, you know, worked two full jobs, bud tending and making CO2 oil. And uh, as I explained to Sharon, his mother, while a short time on earth, he lived a full incarnation. Uh, what, three years ago? No. Christ. Anyway, a bunch of years ago, I had a software company and, and um, I gave it to my partner and then we sold it to one of our former employees. She got to open a coffee house, Cafe Corvo in Bremerton, Washington. I got to give up working as a techie and becoming dedicated to, to hemp. By this point, I've switched to hemp. Uh, Farm Bill 2018. Uh, but more importantly, it means this black man isn't going to prison for a fucking plant. You can get CBD, CBG, terpenes, and a whole lot of other chemistry out of hemp. I'm not giving up anything. My patients, my long-term patients, knew that I changed from THC-specific plants to hemp. They got well. They didn't really care. It also allowed me to sell outside of Washington State. Not that I was doing everything legal in Washington, but Washington is very permissive when it comes to cannabis. Um, I live in King County, and the prosecutor here and the whole legal system, you know, turn a blind eye, but it's, it's not draconian. And so, yes, you know, 11 years, I haven't added it up, I guess, 11 years later, I'm still devoted to this. I can devote more and more of my time to it. Um, I began, obviously, with CBD and epilepsy, Charlotte, not Charlotte's Web specifically, but that era. Um, the market's flooded. Most of the stuff in bottles is shit. Um, I run an artist and company, word of mouth. I never spent a dime on advertising. Um, I know what I'm doing. Um, and... Uh, with that sort of a steady kind of thing, I've become intrigued, you know, speaking of hemp fest, the mantra for cannabis and hemp activists for years was food, fuel, fiber. This is before CBD and medicine was part of the equation. 
So fiber interests me. And um, I began playing with separating herd on the inside, the woody part from bass, the bark on, on the outside, and uh, prepping it for paper making as well as textiles and other stuff. And um, uh, I've switched to growing fiber cultivars. Um, and I have developed a workflow. Let me go back. The first paper maker I worked with worked in the legal mar cannabis market here in Washington State. State, And he would sneak stems out um, to make paper at home. He um, had mixed success. And uh, I gave him hemp stems, not pot. And he shot a video, which he shared with me. And it was going along fine until it got to the part after boiling the stems and pulling the bast off and pounding it to get it soft. He then shows this image of a bottle of lye with the red cross, skull and crossbones. And he puts on these thick rubber gloves like electrical workers use on high tension and, and puts goggles on. And he boils the bast in lye in his kitchen for two or three hours. Needless to say, I'm horrified. So <clears throat> at that point, I made my mind up that yes, LeBlanc was gonna do hemp fiber and paper, textiles, graphene, et cetera, et cetera. I live in Seattle, no Tacoma aroma. So paper makers tend to use lye and all of these toxic caustic chemicals to break the stuff down. That ain't how I fly. You know, I'm an old school hippie, been vegetarian since 1971, you know, lifelong gardener since second grade. Um, I, you know, hike and climb in the mountains out here. There's no way in heck I can condone any kind of workflow that pours lie down the drain. So I then began to look for alternative ways to separate the part of the stem that I wanted for products without killing fish downstream. So no Tacoma aroma, and it's not fair to kill fish downstream. Um, Academia.edu is a wonderful website that has a number of hundreds and hundreds of articles written by both professional scientists and citizen scientists and everyone in between. But it's um, if you don't, if you can't get into PubMed, um, it's a great place to start research. And so one thing led to another. And so we're jumpstarting the hemp industry after a 70 year prohibition hiatus gap. The world has moved beyond the machinery of the day, um, but there aren't necessarily commercially available machines to process hemp. Um, the hemp industry globally has been centered in China, 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 to some degree, East European countries. And if you eat it in this country, it was probably grown in Manitoba in terms of food. So I, I have an RFP out for a machine that is not a decorticator. Um, I have uh, been able, so there's four things in hemp you want to deal with pectin that holds the fibers together, um, lignin, again, holding the fibers together, cellulose, the main component, which is a regular shape, and hemicellulose, which is irregular, that fills in the gaps between cellulose. You want the cellulose. So I have a way to use food-grade enzymes to address the uh, pectin in lignin, and I think I have another way, and I have the machine, I haven't used it yet to get rid of the hemicellulose. The idea being that these are not just uh, eco-responsible solutions, but they're designed to scale up to industrial size and be profitable. This is not a hobby. As my youngest said, dad, you're not going to the big company. Well, no, but I'm doing the, the, the groundwork for big companies to build an industry using hemp um, instead of trees, if it's paper or cardboard, using hemp instead of cotton, 
cotton uses 25% of the Roundup glyphosate. So if you get off of cotton, you reduce the amount of poison poured into the environment. And then it, it goes on in, in the sense that um, everyone hears that I'm growing mushrooms and they assume psilocybin. No, I've been growing um, both food grade, you know, shiitake and lion's mane and uh, oyster mushrooms, cinnamon cap, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm a lifelong vegetarian. But really, um, when people are making leather out of mushrooms, there's a whole lot that they can do. And it's very parallel, not that the life forms are the same, mushrooms and hemp, but they're filling in gaps. They're bringing alternatives to the market Mushroom coffee instead of <clears throat> coffee out of <clears throat> the third world, or um, or uh, hemp grown responsibly as opposed to cotton out of Texas and other states grown with horrible chemicals and destroying the topsoil. I would love to see hemp and cannabis treated like corn, soybeans, and wheat. 